Welcome to the Bernie's Bootlegs Podcast, where we explore the stories of successful musicians and share their perspectives on being an artist in a digital age. I'm your host, Kenny McCabe, and let's get into the show. Greetings, fellow humans. In today's episode, we're speaking with saxophonist and composer Nicole Glover. We discussed working with Jean Perla, the importance of passing down the tradition through mentorship, growing up in Portland and the music scene there, the perspective a day job can give you and why you should try and maintain it, how to achieve faster musical growth by going outside your comfort zone, how just being a nice person can potentially elevate your career, dealing with negative energy, and much more. You can find Nicole on her website at NicoleGlover.com and also on Instagram at NicoleGloverMusic. And so without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Nicole Glover. Okay, guys, I'm here with Nicole Glover. Nicole, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so uh, full disclosure, we actually just talked for a half hour, and um, because my computer froze, we lost all of it. So (laughs) here we are again. You know, this is just... uh, it's kind of just par for course working with technology and um, and in the, in the podcast sphere. You know, I've had so many things happen on the podcast. Like people's phones have died. I've had I've had people get like a Grubhub delivery like right in the middle of the podcast. Like have to have to go get it. So, uh, but it's all good. Such um, a weird time to be alive, no? Yeah, it's super weird. Um, but but here we are once again. And so maybe you can just uh, tell us uh, what you have uh, coming up uh, this month. Sure. Okay, so um, this upcoming weekend, I'm playing with a project that was just started by the great Gene Perla. And um, for those of of you who don't know Gene, you should. Um, He was most known as kind of the bass player with Elvin Jones for several years. Um, But he also contributed to the music of Nina Simone, uh, Sonny Rollins, uh, Frank Sinatra and, and countless others. Uh, Gene's, Gene's the man. And I'm really grateful to be a part of this project that he started uh, with Roxy Koss, also on tenor, two tenors. It'll be a, a lot of fun. Uh, Oscar Williams on piano, who has been touring with Wallace Roney the last couple of years. And Nick Cachopo, who is uh, the drummer in J.D. Allen's trio. So it's a it's a great group, and I'm I'm really looking forward to these gigs. We're doing something at Shapeshifter, um, the famous Deerhead Inn in Delaware Water Gap, and uh, the Lafayette Bar in Easton. And this is just kind of the first run of things, and hopefully we'll be able to get something happening mm, both more locally and internationally next year. Absolutely. And so maybe you can just say a few words about working with Gene because Gene has been around for so long, played with so many different people. Elvin Jones, I think, um, is perhaps one of the biggest contacts in which people may have seen him, although maybe they didn't know who it was at the time. You know, like I believe he played a lot with like the Elvin Jones band with uh, Liebman and, and with Steve Grossman. So maybe yeah. you can just say a few words about working with Gene because he's pretty awesome. Yeah, I'd love to. That's the funny thing is that record Live at the Lighthouse is kind of the one that I point to uh, point people to the most. And it's so funny how often people will say, oh, I love that record. It's like, well, then why didn't you know about Gene? You know, he, he's the bass player on the record. You know, it's 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 crazy. But yeah, Gene, Gene's Gene's great. He's a real connection to that era of music. And to be around people like that is is so important. And I'm I'm really grateful that I get to, you know, imbibe some of that from him. It's he's he's old school. It's really cool to see, and it's 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 fun to hear the stories and and be around that. And and it's cool because you know I, I don't ask Gene for those stories, but he'll offer them up sometimes in relevant situations. And I just think it's really important for us all to be able to spend time with with people from that era, from that generation, because they just have a an outlook and a history that we can't get from history books, that we can't get from from uh, just staying within our own generation. So it's great. Gene's Gene's great. I'm really happy to be working with him. He was kind of the first person to really give me 
a gig when I got to New York too. So I'm really grateful to him for that, for seeing something in me and wanting to to help me out when I was when I was new here. For sure. And I mean, there's obviously something to be said for the like the mentorship aspect and just like, yeah. you know, because I'm sure that like people like Elvin and, you know, other people of like Elvin's generation, they basically did that for Gene. Like when Gene joined yeah. Elvin's band, he was super young, probably like in his in his 20s. Yeah. And so um, I guess it's always, all it's always exactly. Yeah. It's just always nice when people can uh, pass along same kind of information and, and stories and uh, give opportunities to younger people. I mean, just look at like what Art Blakey did, like he would always hire younger people. You know, mm -hmm. because he wanted that, like, in Miles, too. Like, they would always hire younger people to kind of get that, like, I mean, probably for a lot of reasons, but partially to have, like, a new, like, infusion of of a, of a different perspective on the world, you know, being a lot younger. And also just, like, give, like, younger cats, like, an opportunity to, to play and, and to explore and, and to work. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, they're passing it down, essentially. You know, they're passing the torch on to us, the, the next generation, um, to carry it forward. And that's a beautiful thing. And, and I think that, yeah, Gene is, is definitely in the tradition. Wallace Roney, as well as another person who does that, JD, two, two guys I've already mentioned, also are in that lineage of uh, hiring younger musicians and mentoring them on the bandstand, which is so important. Something that um, is, can be in danger of getting lost when, you know, when people start to feel really comfortable um, in their own generation with their own people their own age group you know it's sometimes it's hard to break into that um, I mean for for obvious reasons you know and and but it is it is really important as a, as a younger generation musician to get that opportunity and and um, something that we were talking about before was how George Colligan also gave me that opportunity he also really gave me an on the bandstand mentorship which is a one of the most valuable things i've experienced so far in my musical life um to be able to have that and learn from that uh yeah you can't get that in school you can't get that in the practice room there's there's no way to replace that experience for sure and um you know i'd love to uh touch more on that but maybe before we do that we can just give uh, the audience some context about where you're from you know you're from the west coast i believe and so mm -hmm. uh, and just uh, just give us some uh details about uh, where you grew up and how you got started playing music okay um yeah i grew up in portland oregon and i got into music from my father being a fan of music he's not a musician but he just has good taste he's a good guy and uh, when I was young, he was checking out um, Sonny Rollins, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Cannonball, um, Bill Evans. Those were all early uh, musicians and records that I remember hearing at a young age, which is great, you know, <laughs> way to get started on the right foot. Um, and so I heard that music and I really, I loved it. And um, interestingly, he also was into Ornette and Dolphy and um, some more of, of kind of like the free music from the 60s. And I liked it when I was young. I, I you know, I, I enjoyed that as well. And so when the time came to pick an instrument to play, I wanted to play the saxophone because I liked how it sounded. And, and it just so happened that a lot of the music that he was listening to and that I heard through him featured saxophonists. So I went right for the tenor. I didn't start with alto. I went right for the tenor and fell in love with it. Um, then growing up in Portland, there was a really fertile music education environment. Um, and I was trying to soak up as much of that as possible. Uh, especially during that time, there were a lot of people who were living in Portland, who were a lot of, who were very serious musicians uh, with a lot of experience, with a lot of history, who had moved from New York to kind of have a, a slower vibration way of living. Um, but additionally, uh, there were people like Leroy Vinegar and Andrew Hill, uh, Charlie Rouse, who lived out there. And so they really infused some of that, um, that serious energy into the scene. And so there was a really strong community and a lot of places to play, which sadly is not so much the case anymore. But at the time, um, it was happening. So 
I got a lot out of that and ultimately then um, decided to go to school. I went to William Patterson University. Um, and while I was there, I was studying with uh, the great Rich Perry. And I also was able to be around Mulgrew Miller and Harold Mayburn, um, two of the really great piano masters of the music. Um, and that was a blessing for all of us who got to be a part of that and all of us who got to experience um, what they had to give. And the beautiful thing about them is they gave a lot. We're very generous with their time and with their energy and with their knowledge. And um, they, they were beautiful people. And yeah, they, they, what they did cannot so easily be replaced. And so I'm, I'm really grateful that I got to be there at the time that, that both of those true masters were there. Um, then I went back to, to Portland for a little bit. And that's where I was kind of starting to work professionally for the first time. Um, that's where I met George. Um, that's where I, I started, you know, kind of figuring out what it means to to be a, a professional musician, I guess, to, to work as a musician. And I was just practicing a lot, studying a lot. And then I, I you know, after four years, I came back here. And now I've been here for another four years. And since I've been back here, I've, I've um, been working. I've been teaching and playing music. Not right away. Not right away. I had to, I had to definitely make some sacrifices. I had to work a non-music job for a bit and just survive living here before I was able to get that. But now um, I'm happy to say that, you know, I, I've been able to get to the point where I'm working via music exclusively yeah that's awesome and uh seems to be working out fairly well so far i mean as far nice. as I, as far as i can tell and so uh, yeah i didn't i didn't ask you this in in the first uh take but um would, did you ever have any inclinations to do anything besides music or was that always kind of the the track well for me that was that was the that was the track and the, the reason that i had to do the non-music job it sounds counterintuitive, but it was to fulfill the track, right? Because I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I had to be here, that I had to be in New York. Um, but you, before you can do anything, you need shelter, you need food. And so I had to make rent. I had to do it. And, and so I, I, you know, I, I ended up um, taking um, a job. And, and for a couple years, I was actually, I was involved in the wine world. I became a certified sommelier and I was a, a buyer for a, um, an unnamed major corporation. So weird. <laughs> Such a very different life experience than what I'm used to. Um, but, you know, I did it so that I could get to this point. It was all to serve the, the course, to stay on course. Uh, just, it took a little while. And I had to be really patient, and there were times where I was extremely frustrated, but um, I just, I mean, I did what I had to do. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, whenever I, it. yeah, definitely. And so whenever I hear someone talk negatively about having a, a day gig or like saying that they don't want to do it or they don't know how or whatever, I just tell them, dude, like David Binney worked as a secretary in a law office for 10 years. Yeah, there's a bunch of those stories. You know, there's the famous McCoy cab story, working as a cab driver. I think someone was a janitor. Um, I, I heard recently that Ed Blackwell and Ornette met each other at a department store. Did you know that? that was, no, yeah, I had not that heard was, that one. Yeah, I know. It was crazy. They met working at a department store. You know, I mean, there's no shame in doing what you have to, what you have to do. I mean, there's no way around it. And, and, you know, that's it. You can't, you, there's nothing you can do. If you need to, if you need to make it happen, you got to do it. And honestly, uh, it gives you, a, a, you know, a fresher perspective. I think for me, it, 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 it helped me maintain a healthy perspective on what it is that as musicians we're doing and why. And, and, you know, it was, it was a thing that allowed me to kind of get out of my head 
it's like, come on, like, yeah, you know, what? there's all these petty fears and concerns that we have all the time. And it's like, come on, like, we get to play music. This is, you know, there's, there's, it's a blessing. There's a lot we could be doing that isn't this. Oh, definitely. You know, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and another story, you know, just, just along those lines, just like Tim, Tim Warfield, who um, is a great saxophone player, like, at a, I believe, at, at a, like right out of college, um, you know, he worked in a warehouse, like like loading pallets and, and stuff like this, like driving a forklift, probably like, I don't know, maybe he'll come on and tell us about it. But um, yeah. yeah, I just remember because I had a music business class with him for one semester. And I just remember him saying like, man, after I worked in a warehouse, I was so driven to, 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 to get better at music because I never wanted to do that again. It was, yeah. it was so hard on, yeah. on, on, on his body and just like all these things. It, it actually like motivated him. It gave him like a whole different perspective. Oh yeah, absolutely. Honestly, honestly, I can always tell when somebody has worked a non-music job. I can always tell. There's something, there's like a, there's a certain thing that it gives you. Yeah, it's a drive to to not have to do that again you know but it also i mean beyond that it, it gives you perspective of other things you know it, it gives you perspective of, of other people in the world and 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 you know it puts you in contact with people that you wouldn't be in contact with normally and and it gives you experience that's been really valuable i mean i had a lot of responsibility at my job and i was you know responsible for people and and communication and and it's things that all has kind of helped me you know in, in the music aspect too but I think what it did the most is it made me want to free my soul. You know, when I went to play, it was like, it was like, this is it. You know, this is what I've been working all day for is to get to the gig. And so then at that point, you know, I'm not thinking about like, oh, what do I, you know, do I sound how I want it? It's like, no, fuck that. You know, I'm playing like I'm, I'm trying to free my soul here. So. I don't know. It was an interesting experience, but all that being said, I'll take what I'm doing now over that any day. You know, the, the any time it gets tough with like touring, really intense touring schedules, or 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 any you know any kind of difficult thing that we encounter with being a musician, it's like psh, I'd still take that over anything else. Exactly, and I mean it's true that any job is going to have its positives and its negatives. I mean. Perhaps um, one of the things that people will encounter out there is just like the the archetypal story of like your aunt at Thanksgiving dinner who's just like, so how's the music thing going? Like, are you still doing that music thing? <laughs> like, yeah. So how, how do you how do you make money though? Or like, uh, <laughs> just like all these questions. And so, you know, it, it's in a way like it's nice to be able to. Uh, I mean, you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but I'm sure it's nice to be able to uh, make money only doing music, even if sometimes it does suck because, like, the airline won't let you take your instrument on, or like someone doesn't pay you on time, or the or the club owner is is an asshole, or any any anything. But God, yeah. I just like got a, a, a like a PTSD flashback from you mentioning the instrument thing. Yeah, it's hard. People, it's really hard, you know, like uh, uh, to to have people understand what it is we're uh, we're trying to do. It's very it's a very strange thing, and and we kind of touched on this before, but like in 2019, playing jazz music, it, there's it's it's not an easy choice to make. There's a lot of sacrifices that that, that need to be made in order to to do this, I suppose. For sure, and so um, I love to uh, talk about um bandstand experience and how that differs from being in a practice or being in a college you know earlier you mentioned george colligan so i was wondering if you could recap uh some of your early experiences with george and how that uh was for you sure um well george definitely gave me an opportunity that i feel and felt nah, i would say in retrospect i don't feel this way but at the time i really felt like i wasn't ready for it. And what I mean when I say in retrospect that I don't agree is, I mean, I do think that in many ways I was, I, you know, I was really inexperienced with certain things and I, I really didn't have that sort of bandstand playing experience that, that I think that someone of his caliber should have, you know, some, if, if you're going to be playing with George, you know, you got to be at a certain, a certain place. And I wasn't really there with, with music or life experience, but, um, 
but it was the time. It was time to get thrown into the deep end and swim. And, and that's what George gave to me. And I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, one story in particular is I remember one of the first times that I played with him, we were getting ready to play the first set and he passed out a new chart to everyone on the bandstand. And I was looking at it. I had no idea it was different meters, different harmonic. I, there were chords I had never seen in my life. I was in my head going like, okay, E, like trying to spell out the chords. I'm like, what would that even sound like? No concept. And then he said, oh, it's, it's in concert. And then he said, oh, it's here. Like, All right, well, here we go. And, you know, of course I, I kind of, I did my best, but of course it, I fell apart and it was embarrassing. It was totally embarrassing and, and a stressful experience for me. But the thing is, is he kept doing it. He kept, he said, yeah, it's going to happen. You're going to be, you're going to be put in situations that you're going to be uncomfortable. Welcome to, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is, this is what you wanted. This is what you need. And so he gave that to me and, and, you know, over time it got easier and and I'm really grateful that he did that for me because besides just the musical training that that gives you to be able to read in concert, to be able to sight read, to be able to read, you know, difficult chords, whatever. Um, I think almost more importantly, it, it made me um, comfortable and less afraid to be in situations where I, I it's out of my comfort zone or where I have to take risks or where I have to do something unfamiliar, you know, jump into the unknown with people that, that, you know, maybe I, I've never played with before or, you know, whatever it may be to, to um, trust myself, to trust my intuition and, and play and, and not be so concerned with, um, with kind of the petty egotistical things that we're always so concerned with. How do I sound? Do people like me? What blah, 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 you know? So, I think that um, by being put in these uncomfortable situations, it, it made me have to be less concerned about the petty ego stuff and more just aware of like, okay, got to do it. You know, got to just, I got to just play. I got to be inside the music because that's the only way, that's the only way to do it. Um, if, you know, if you're inside the music and the music's coming through you, you can't assess it. You can't let, this get in the way which is obviously way easier said than done um training yourself to not think is like i mean that's what zen masters and martial arts masters have been trying to do for years you know that's what that's like the the whole mystery of life right that's the 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 how do you achieve nirvana thing you know how do you get to a place of total stillness of total lack of of um of judgment of lack of thought it's like it's it's way easier said than done but we have to try i think you know we can't we can't let all this stuff that eats away at us all this classic like self-loathing artist thing that we all see it, it you know as, as hard as it is we, we have to try to not let that get in the way of of the music yeah, and I mean, in the end, it's not sustainable, right? It's just like if, if every time you play a terrible solo or you mess up something on like, like you're saying, like reading a site, I like sight reading, like a concert chart as a transposing instrument. Like if every time you, you, you mess something up, you're really like hard on yourself and have like all this negative self-talk and, you, and you're genuinely upset about it, like that's not sustainable. Like you can't do that over a long period of time. And so oh, in, people in, go insane. Yeah, yeah, I've seen people go insane over stuff like that. I've seen people quit over stuff like like that. You know. Yeah, and it's just like <laughs> if you want to be able to play music, then you're gonna have to, I think, learn to not judge yourself so harshly and and learn to just kind of accept that uh, you're not perfect. You're gonna make mistakes. Even yeah. people at the highest level are gonna make mistakes. But um, if you if you beat yourself up too much, then you're gonna just get dark about the whole thing and and you're gonna quit. Yeah, and I mean, in line with what we were talking about with maintaining perspective, um, I think it's you, you have to do it here, too. I mean, yes, I think it's good to hold yourself to a high standard. And I do hold myself to a very high standard. And, and for me, you know, I see, like, where I, you know, 
I know how far I have to go. And that's, but that's a beautiful thing. That used to be a terrifying thing for me and a very frustrating thing. But now I see it as kind of a, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's like the, the lifelong journey of learning. It, it will never end. It will never end. Every day that I wake up, I can follow that, that path. And that's, that's, it's a blessing. And, um, I think also one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately that again is easier said than done is, is maintaining the perspective on what exactly is it we're doing. I mean, for me thinking about um, playing music, playing jazz music or whatever, you know, whatever title a person puts to it. Um, you know what is it we're what is it we're doing here? We're we're trying to we have to serve the music. We can't serve our own our our own ego. In a way, it's it's bigger than me. It's bigger than than any individual person. I think that um, I think that for me, it has to really be about the bigger picture. I mean, we're all part of the the tapestry of the music. We're all part of the fabric of it. And I think that um, being able to maintain that perspective for me of of trying to just take care of the music. Um, that's, I think that's really important. Just the love of the music is, is, is the thing that, that we all need to do. And, and, and I think when people get too caught up with their own selves, their own gratification of who they are as a person or as an artist, it, it's, it's hard, but you, you can't let yourself get into that, that trap, I think, because it's so easy to fall into that trap, but that's not even really what, what all of this is about. I, I believe. For sure. And, you know, one thing that goes along with this entire conversation is just the concept of being a nice person. And so yeah. I'd love to get your thoughts on why people should be nice and how, um, I guess, uh, how important it is for people to be nice. Yeah, I mean, the thing that, you know, I was thinking before is like, there is a difference between niceness and, and feigned sincerity. And there, you know, you don't want to be fake. That's that's for sure. You don't want to be insincere. But I think that, you know, I think it's <laughs> there's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of things going against uh, against us. And when I say us, I mean, that can be anything that can be the, the musical community, the world, the just to be a person in the world. There's a lot going against you. You know, it, it's it can be really tough sometimes. And and. And also, yeah, playing, you know, playing jazz is now is it's hard. Like I said, it's a hard path, and and there's a lot of damaged souls in this, and and a lot of hurt people. Um, I think that we just have to try as much as we can to um, to build each other up and to give it up to each other and, and, and spread positivity and to spread love as much as, as we can. Um, there's no room for, for negativity because there's already so much of it. We have to try to counter it. You know, we have to look out for each other. I really believe that. And we have to find a way to give back to music that's given us all so much. And to, to me, part of that is by being a good person and, and, being good to your fellow musicians and, 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 and helping each other and, and being cool, just being cool. I think that's important. And, and, and really the people that I love the most musically tend to be really good people. I mean, sure, there were people who weren't and they made cool music and that's fine. But just for me personally, I, 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 I think I would rather you know, build people up, then break them down. I would tend to agree. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just, it's, it's sad. There's a lot of people who would, who are, you know, but it all comes back to the, this like insecure ego thing, I think, you know, really, I mean, the people who, you know, I can think of specific people, I'm not going to name names this time, but I can think of specific people who, you know, people would pinpoint as being like an asshole or being a negative uh, force in the community. And I think when I really think about these people, I think that they're just hurt. I think that they're hurt people and they don't know how to how to deal with it, you know, so they take it out on, on other people. 
And so that's it's just more reason why we need to try to to cut through cut through that, you know. For sure, and this is something that I've been trying to change my thinking on, which is just like if someone has time in their life to literally consume your content or whatever and then leave some negative shit about it. Like if you have time for that, okay, there's something wrong with this picture of of how you're spending your time. Like yeah. from my point of view, I don't have time. I'm too busy like doing all the things that I want to do to literally go and consume someone's content and then leave them a negative comment or, or whatever, or just like be a negative person. And so um, this is an uh, this idea does not originate with me. I stole this from like uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, who like I'm sure a lot of people on the internet have have seen, yeah, in yeah. one context or another. But um, yeah, so I've been trying to change my thinking. Like, don't get mad at them. Like, have empathy for them. Like, because there's like like you're saying. Like, I think that there's something negative going on in their life that's making them want to uh, spread that and kind of like uh, get um, <laughs> like just maybe distract like from from their own uh shortcomings or problems in their life yeah it's hard you know that's the thing is all these concepts that we're talking about having empathy for someone you know um turning off your brain like these are all things that are so hard in practice it, it seems so obvious but it's so hard in practice and and i think that that you know doing that work though trying to get to that place is is it's it's as important as practicing your instrument like that it's it's interesting you know what it is that that we're trying to do it's really it's a very holistic thing it's everything it's not just about this it's about so much more and and a lot of these concepts um that we're talking about i think require a lot of work a lot of personal work and searching and and um and i i i believe that that for me, I, that work is, is just as important as anything that has to do with music. Well said. And so, Nicole, tell us about what we can expect from you uh, in the next year. Um, I'm not sure when this will be out, but it is likely like pretty close to, to 2020, if not already 2020 by the time this gets released. So tell us uh, what you have going on like in, in January, February and March and um, yeah, just tell us what, uh, what people can look forward to. Okay, cool. Um, so 2020, um, in January, February and March, I'm going to be beginning a residency at smoke jazz club, uh, every Sunday night at 10 30 PM. I'm going to be there with my own band and, um, I'm also going to be leading a band at smalls on January 29th from 10 30 to 1 eastern time and um for those who aren't in new york you can watch that on the smalls live website um i'm also going to be doing a tour with um my dear friend rodney green uh, and his band jackson miller we're going to be doing um a european leg a japanese leg and a korean leg for pretty much all of march which is really exciting, um, and I I'm, I'm, can't wait for that. I'm, I'm really happy for Rodney as well. Um, and let me see. I think in February I'm going to be going home for the Portland Jazz Festival, actually. And speaking of George, I'm going to be doing a really exciting gig with George um, and Billy Hart for the Portland Jazz Festival. It'll be my first time playing with, with Billy Hart, so I'm really looking forward to, to that. Um yeah, I think that's kind of the the highlights of the beginning of next year. So it's a for me, it's a really exciting start to the year. Yeah, no doubt. And uh, yeah, all that stuff is going to be super awesome. I would encourage everyone to check it out. And um, where is the best place for people to keep up with what you're doing, Nicole? Um, my website is NicoleGlover.com. And uh, my Instagram is Nicole Glover Music. I, I I try to to keep them updated as much as I can remember to. So I think I think um, both of those places are going to have information about about uh, the gigs and tours. Right on, Nicole. Any final thoughts? Anything you'd like to put out into into the world? No pressure. Hmm. I would say uh, maintain the warrior spirit 
always in everything that you do like uh you know put yourself fully into into everything that you're doing don't give up be persistent the world needs what you have and the world needs what you have like and try not to compare yourself be you because we need more people who are them well said oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> nicole thank you so much for doing this and for doing this thank interview you. twice you know <laughs> I, I cannot uh, commend you enough for that you know um so so thank you yeah my pleasure thank you so much for having me you're very welcome and uh hopefully we can do this again soon uh stay in the line for for one second uh, thanks again you got it thank you thank you so much for checking out the podcast Don't forget to subscribe wherever you happen to be listening to this. And if you enjoy the podcast, consider giving it a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. For more episodes, please visit berniesbootlegs.com. Thanks again and see you guys next time.